Now uh, I kindly ask to speak His Excellency, uh, the permanent representative of Sri Lanka, uh, Mr. Mohan Peros. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, having listened to uh, the presentations this morning, I was wondering whether we as members of the global family should be really saying mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. It is a tragic story, isn't it? I was reminded of the biblical psalm, Psalm 127, verses 3 to 5, which says, Behold, children are a gift from our Creator. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of the warrior, so are children of one's youth. How blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. They will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies at the gate. Mr. Chairman, the irony is that the world does not place a high value on children, particularly in the context of armed conflict. It is a matter of record that 415 million children live in conflict-affected areas. In high-intensity conflict areas, it is a staggering 140 9 million, which is double the number of children in the United States. Mr. Chan, having said that, I wish to thank the permanent missions of the Russian and, the, and Kazakhstan and the UN Special Representative of the Secretary General on Children and Armed Conflict for organizing this discussion on a very important topic. Sad topic, really. I also thank Mr. Boronkov, Under Secretary General for Counterterrorism and other briefers for, as I said, their soul-searching, insightful presentations. I cannot but quote the late Nelson Mandela, who said, quote, There can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children." Unquote. Now, this is now no more relevant than ever as we witness children disproportionately suffering from discrimination, exclusion, inequality. The plight of children is worsened by the prolonged effects of poverty, all forms of violence and conflict. Mr. Chairman, sadly, as most of us present today would know, my country, Sri Lanka, experienced the phenomenon of child soldiers at the hands of a group of non-state actors. This group used intimidation and terror tactics to pressurize families of the Tamil community in Sri Lanka to give their sons and daughters for their military purposes. When families refused, the children were abducted from schools or taken forcibly from their homes. Parents who resisted such recruitment faced violence, detention, and even death. We are all too aware of what happens to children in the hands of such groups. As such, following the neutralization of this group in 2009, the government of Sri Lanka had a substantial task in relation to rehabilitation and reconciliation. One of the first priorities, I would say, of the government was to look after these children who had been forced to adorn the cyanide capsule around their necks, to rehabilitate them, reunite them with their families, restore normalcy in their lives, and help them become productive and proud citizens. All of these child soldiers 594 of them were rehabilitated and reunited with their families. Special attention was given to those whose education had been disrupted due to conscription and who were desiring to complete their formal education. As a result, a number of former child soldiers participated 
in the national examinations. Eleven children took up to the university entrance examinations and three went on to gain university admission to a universities and university education. Many others underwent vocational training and are now in meaningful employment. I'm just going to show you a little photograph of you will see of a child soldier holding up the cyanide capsule. There we are. Here is another soldier with one of her handlers who are now actually living in the United Kingdom without any sanction whatsoever. Here is another picture of the child soldiers in, in the back of a tractor. Now these are things that we don't want to see at all hereafter. It is well recognized that involvements in violent conflict and loss of loved ones cause trauma and other psychological effects that affect the child's growth and education. These children, Mr. Chairman, were provided with professional counseling. Those that were disabled, injured and required medical intervention were well looked after. National identity cards were provided to them, giving them a sense of belongingness. So as a matter of policy, no child soldier was prosecuted with priority being accorded to their investigations and speedy disposal of their cases. This was done with the assistance of the United Nations agencies, the ICRC and civil society organizations. Sri Lanka had a success story to share with the world. Unfortunately, this is now a forgotten story. It is deeply regrettable that certain sectors of the international community and even certain entities of the United Nations refuse to acknowledge such success stories. We continue to be hounded for defeating terrorism. They continue to be misled by the misinformation being spread by the remnant elements of this group of non-state actors that had brought such misery to their own con community and children. They continue to remain hostage to the political benefits accrued with such double standards. If we are serious about sustainably dealing with the issues arising out of conflict, then I say including that of children, we need to remove the wool over our eyes. We need to work on common ground and face the reality if we are to make any real progress for humanity. Mr. Chair, Sri Lanka will continue to look after our own children and ensure that everyone will have a success story to tell and I wish these other children suffering in the rest of the world would someday be emancipated from the misery that we are causing and would be free to live as members of a happy human family. Thank you Mr. Chairman. I thank you Your Excellency for, for a really eloquent and persuasive statement.